Bell here for Geek Pulse. And I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, Nerdy Dustin, unfortunately, has his work. You know, he's got real, until this is our full-time jobs, we have to do real people work, which is usually kind of boring. But today I'm joined with Matt. What's up, bud? Hey, I'm doing well. So, uh, you know, working on some stuff here. I've uh, been filming my latest movie review. So, you know, doing stuff like that. Sweet. You know, I meant for movie reviews, you're in the right place here. Um, so what we love. We love talking movies, and that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk all about our love of the movies from the 2000s. We're going to catch up on, you know, movie news. I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about my time in Las Vegas for the first time, including kind of sneaking into CinemaCon. Um, <laughs> and we'll do all that and more. Uh, so how's your week been so far, Matt? So far, so good. Um, yeah, it's one of those things where I've been Getting back into doing the movie review stuff, uh, I've had sort of a hiatus from it, having to uh, get back into screenwriting and doing a few other stuff to like actually get my name out there into the industry. But getting back into doing some of these movie reviews, uh, specifically, I've started what well, it's like the uh, Jurassic World Dominion script has already been fully written. It's been written for about half a year now. And uh, really, it's uh, writing the next two reviews uh, that me and my buddy Tyler have been doing so far, which uh, the next two re reviews that we've been writing were for the WWE straight to DVD movie Knucklehead and then Agent Cody Banks 2. <laughs> Dude, man, you know how to pick them. Like, seriously, it, it's that's that's what's, you know, people could jump on to every every trend and topic. And I think that's a. Uh, kind of a fault of the world we live in if you want to be like relevant in the youtube space but you know i like that you're not afraid just to like go after jurassic world you know uh, you know dominion duke agent cody banks too i love that man that's so cool uh before we get any further wh what's that ink you got on your arm there show off your ink there brother oh um well it's like this one specifically uh it's like my left arm so we got the mandalorian mythosaur crest um, on my wrists, we have two different quotes from Yoda. Um, it's like, so here we have, uh, do or do not, there is no try. And then the greatest teacher failure is, so episode five, episode eight. And then over here, you have the symbol of the Galactic Empire. Yes. So all, all my tattoos are Star Wars related, so. That's cool. That's, you know, I'm an ink nerd myself, man. I, I love, I love tattoos. Uh, I'm going to get more. They're very addictive. As soon as I got my first one, I'm like another, you know, yeah. Yeah, like, it's like this, this one was actually my very first tattoo. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I, uh, I've got, uh, let's see, Jason Voorhees right, Jason. with a scorpion. Cause I'm a Scorpio. I've got nice. my Ghostbusters VHS nice. tape here. I got a little, Dr. Stephen Strange here on this arm and a couple other ones that really aren't nerd related, but I, uh, I don't know. I just think the tattoos and being a nerd go, go hand in hand. Uh, oh, because you, man. especially, you know, it's a, such a themat thematic art we love, man. So to yeah. show that off on one's body, I think it's the ultimate compliment. So do you have plans yeah. for more? Uh, for more tattoos, a hundred percent. If I wasn't broke. <laughs> oh, that's the only thing. Yes, it, it does yeah. cost a pretty penny, but uh, totally yeah. worth it. Totally worth yeah. it. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's like this one specifically. I think it was like, you know, like three fifty or something like that. But it was like yeah. over the course of like two different sessions. So it's like, you know, nice. you won the lottery tomorrow. Let's say you can get a big a piece as you want to. Uh, what would you get? What would be like the ultimate piece? Well, uh, it's not a movie piece specifically, but uh, on this arm. It would be sort of a half sleeve going up and down. Originally, um, the half sleeve idea I originally had was going to be like this really intricate alternate poster design for um, Inglorious Bastards, which used to be my all time favorite movie. But instead, I sort of wanted to be like a tribute to my grandfather, where there's like a um, like a, a white tailed deer, there's woods in the background, stuff like that. And there, uh, on each one of the antlers, there would be like each of the letters of his initials. You know, he's not Dude. dead, or anything. he's not dead or anything. It'd just be like a nice tribute. That's excellent. That's that's really really cool. Full Harry Potter sleeve and a full Alien vs. Predator sleeve on the other arm. Then I would go the Dark Crystal. Boom! That's a great answer. 
Oh my God, man. Onyx Demon, welcome, brother. It's been a while. It's been a while. I know you're someone that loves tattoos. Um, for me, I would probably get, um, I would get something like, I would probably get my entire back and just the Jaws movie poster. I that think nice. it's a gigantic and I'm at the beach. How awesome. It would look awesome anyway, but you're at the beach and you roll up in a gigantic freaking, yeah, you dude, Onyx Demon, you got like tons of good tattoos that'd be awesome um i think that you know i i definitely smaller pieces i think right here i want a flux capacitor i think would be yeah, a great little piece right there um but i just have so many jaws would be sick as a kneecap, kneecap tat. Yeah. Ooh, that would be yeah. oh my god man they say that's yeah. gonna be they say a kneecap is a little tender for sure okay. there's um there's this one design i saw on um uh tiktok i think it was where it was like a, a finger tattoo but it was like um, Doodle Bob and a trampoline, and you would bend it and go. Bong, 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 bong. <laughs> that is also brilliant, and it's the clever stuff. Like I love King of the Hill, so I love seeing bobby pins. It's literally Bobby Bobby Hill in the body of a bobby pin. Simple. Simple. I I would also get a King of the Hill tattoo. Come on, man. Um, I'm so excited about the King of the Hill revival. Um, yeah, it's like happened. there's uh, one of my buddies. Um, it's like a long time ago. He actually got a tattoo. Uh, it's like I knew him from high school. He got a tattoo like right over here. It says, I sell propane and propane accessories. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. More King of the Hill nerds in the in the world. My favorite cosplay of all time happened at Dragon Con. And again, one of the greatest conventions ever you could ever go to for cosplay, period. Um, you can see like someone that spent $5,000 on an Iron Man costume and it fully works. And that's kind of impressive, but it's not as impressive as mm, these guys were all the King of the Hill gang. And they, yeah. they just happened to be born naturally resembling the characters. They mm -hmm. were in costume. They had built a, the fucking fence behind them on wheels. And all they did was go from location to location. And then just out of a cooler. drink beers and just, <laughs> that's perfect. Brilliant. It's yeah. perfect. And what a fun time, too. You get all everyone taking your picture. So you get that adrenaline rush, and you're just, like, drinking beers in front of the, the fence, and you just put it on wheels. So great. Yeah. It's so great. It's the little things in this world, man. The little yeah. things. 100%. Uh, yeah. I remember I remember uh, one cosplay I did. I used to have the helmet for it. I sold it recently. Um, but I had a Stormtrooper helmet, and I wore a flannel shirt. And you know, blue jeans, all that sort of stuff, cowboy boots. And I had a picket sign with me. And it said, Palpatine did nothing wrong. Oh, hell yeah. So Onyx Demon's got 21 tattoos currently, but I'm broken. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the key. Money, yeah. right? Money. Money yeah. does make the world go round and makes the ink go on your skin. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I like also, if I'd spend all my money on cosplay too. That would be, that would be a thing. So it'd be mm -hmm. tattoos, money, cosplay. Of course, after all, my family and friends are taken care of. That's the thing. That's those lottery wish dreams. Um, yeah. But uh, speaking of dreams, someone had a dream. Oh, not, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., but he did. But this other person had a dream to create a video game movie that would actually break a billion dollars. And by God, the Mario movies finally did that. It broke a billion dollars at the global box office, man. Yeah, I heard about that. Like, it's... It's the very first video game movie to ever do so, and of course it's Nintendo coming off of, you know, not having done a movie since 1993 with the original Super Mario yeah. Bros. movie, and that's the reason why they didn't want to make another movie. <laughs> no, they're like, done, up, nope, nope, one and done. It's like, it's like, they were the pioneers, they made the very first video game movie out there, and now they're pioneers again, having the very first video game movie break a billion at the box office. And well deserved that that movie. Yeah. Okay, so a lot it's of people. A, it's not a great movie, but it's, it's a fun movie. movie. It's a fun movie. Next closest would be what the World of Warcraft movie. Yeah. Uh, so, so the Warcraft movie from uh, 2017 that was around 700 some odd million yeah. uh, at the box office. Uh, I I like it. It's like it's not a great movie, but it, it's a fun time. It's like I do think that uh, critics were unnecessarily harsh to it, Absolutely. but I, I I will agree on one aspect of the human characters, with maybe the exception of the wizard, uh, like the sort of wizard guy in that. They're not interesting at all, and the most interesting characters in that movie are the orcs. Yes, by far the orcs are the most interesting characters in that. Yeah, 
but I enjoyed it too. I'm, I'm in the same camp as you guys. I, I get I, the critics. This, I don't know. Those, if you think of a movie critic, typically, especially when that movie came out, it's like, you know, just older white dudes, like behind the, behind their keyboards. It's, you would think that would be the base audience, but apparently it was not. Um, but what you're saying about the Super Mario Bros movie, it's, it played it, it played it safe. That's what it did. It was just very middle of the road. It catered to a lot of the fans, but just as far as the story and everything, played it safe. And that's what got it to a billion. But I don't think that's going to be what happens with the next Mario verse movies coming. We're going to get some really entertaining movies, but they had to play it safe to crack that billion dollar mark. And hey, it worked. Plus, it, plus it's Mario. It's of yeah. course going to make a billion at the box office. It's Mario. It And it's an animated movie. It's going to get in that audience much more than, uh, you know, say, like the Uncharted movie did uh, earlier last year. Or was yeah. it early? No, it was last year. Um, where it's like, again, the Uncharted movie, and I'm a huge fan of the Uncharted franchise. I, yeah. it, It's like, those are some of my favorite characters in all of gaming. The Uncharted movie is okay. But a lot of the same territory has been pretty much done with every other action-adventure movie ever made. Yes. And as much as I love Tom Holland, you know, it's like maybe Nathan Drake was not exactly his wheelhouse. Grossly uh, miscast. Miscast for sure. I mean, it, I don't think he was bad in the role. The one who I think was grossly miscast was Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> it's like... Okay, it's so... Like, yeah. It's like, it's My, just... it's He's just not... Victor Sullivan. He's not at all. <laughs> Onyx Demons, he's like, no, I kind of liked it. I mean, I feel you. Um, but uh, I, I agree with what you're saying, Onyx, about uh, about critics and you trying to, like, you know, avoid movies because critics hated them. If I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go to any film at all if I was to not see a movie because a critic said it was shitty. Yeah, it's like I, for example, um, Oh, what's what's like one movie that like was lambasted by by critics, but it's like I saw it anyway, and I'm just like, the hell were they thinking? This is awesome. It's like or like any horror movie until like three years ago, like every critic was like, and then now horror is trendy and popular, and the critics are like, yeah, it's great. But before then, they gave it shitty reviews. Is it critics anymore though? It's just regular people. Yeah, the 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 movie critic doesn't really exist. There's the OGs. But now it's just like anyone can do it. And yeah. it's not as specialized. It used to be like they were film, like they would go to, they were almost in film school and they would be knowledgeable. They would, you know, they knew they could speak about cinematography, an equal playing field as, you know, just the script writing process. And now, yeah, it's kind of like any Joe Schmo can do it. Well, yeah, it's because of the the openness of the internet. It's like since the internet has become so open and pretty much everyone can get into it, uh, I mean, pretty much, it's the old saying: everyone's a critic. It's a like, right. because, you know, But the the whole thing is, film and uh, media in and of itself is a subjective medium. Everyone True. is going to have a, a very drastically different opinion depending on what the film is. For example, I could absolutely love something like The Last Jedi, where someone you know in that same exact fandom will shit on it to the end of his dying day. I like The Last Jedi. I mean, come on. I mean, like, I didn't love it, but I certainly don't need to, like, throw yeah. it in the... I liked The Phantom Menace yeah. when it came out. I yeah. was young. I watched that okay, shit. It was, was good. It's a, when, when Phantom Menace came out, I was two. So I, I wouldn't have really seen it in the theater. It's a, but when Attack of the Clones came out, I was like four going on five years old. I was that perfect demographic going in and I was just like, this is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you, that's the, the eloquence of your point. Yeah, it's it's subjective. Um, but yeah. honest demon, I, I remember the cartoon, The Critic. I love that so much. That needs to, that needs to get a revival. That needs to get a, everyone can be a critic, but when you critique genres and themes, you don't prefer to agree. And then you ruin the show for some other potential viewers. Yeah, that's the thing. I agree with that completely. Yeah, that's what you. I, I agree with that, Onyx. Yeah, hundred ten percent. It's just like um, I don't know, and and also a film could be critically acclaimed, but don't. I mean, like let's just take Evil Dead Rise, critically acclaimed, audience score and critics. Yet it's just it's doing okay in the box office. It's yeah, not. It's, 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 it's okay. But then again, most R-rated films don't usually do incredible at the box office because it does limit that audience. Uh, especially R-rated, you know, horror films. You know, there 
there is that audience. There is that audience out there. But a lot of, you know, uh, there are a lot of factors in which, you know, it just can, you know, slide it into like a certain factor. Like Evil Dead hasn't been in the theater since 2013. You know, right. And it's mostly been gaining popularity on television because of Ash vs. Evil Dead. And it's video like, games, you know, the and video, and video, video games game really awesome. stuff like that. It was specifically the Evil Dead video game that came out recently. But again, it's a limited audience compared to someone who's going to go out and see the next Blumhouse generic ghost movie that's coming out. Or, True. Or, you know, if you have Scream or any of the other bigger bigger name uh masked villains jason freddy you know so on and it's like True. michael myers michael myers perfect example and i did i did think that ash versus the evil dead was underrated more people should have watched that did that was that stars it was what on channel? stars was that with stars so i would i'd stars. imagine that was also part of it if that had been like netflix or something yeah. else then it would have been uh, bruce campbell bruce campbell actually made fun of that fact when he was doing one of his shows. Uh, yeah, it's it's currently on Netflix, but it's one of those things where it originally, the first, those three seasons that did come out, it aired on Stars, And at the time, it was the most pirated show yep. ever. It's like no one was watching it when it came out on TV. And it, they got those three seasons out, but then they just canceled the show after that. So, but as comparatively as say Netflix brought it up, it would be completely different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh man. And again, that just goes into how everything is subjective. So we're, this is a perfect segue. We're talking about, you know, everyone's a critic. So there's a movie coming out that the pretty much the world is critical of the main actor. And that's going to be the flash. So that is going to be a very interesting thing. I myself could not be more pumped about it just because of Michael Keaton. Um, But it recently was shown in its entirety in whatever cut it exists in currently. The VFX is not done, but it's CinemaCon in Las Vegas. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of spoilers are all over the freaking yeah. internet. Well, so don't think go on this way. With, it, with it being so close to the release as it is, it's pretty much at its final cut. Like yeah. it's like they're at its final stages. If there's any VFX that need to be done, it's maybe one or two shots at most. Uh, it's one of those things where um, there's only like few movies that have, you know, been released within weeks of its final, final cut. Uh, one that I can think of right off the top of my head is uh, the rise of Skywalker. They were about three or four weeks out from the release date before uh, locking in the final cut and their final bits of VFX. Now yeah. it's like that, that's a big example right there. Uh, or any of the more recent Marvel movies, you know, they're like, you know, a couple months out or at least like a week out from their release and they're still working on the VFX over time. Do you think the actions of Ezra Miller and the fact that that was dominating the news cycles a while back will be a detriment like a, a, a measurable detriment to the film's release. If the film had been released last year when it was as big as it was, I think it would have had a much larger impact on the box office because it was originally planned to release last year. But yeah. due to COVID and all that sort of stuff, it drastically delayed the release. However, with it still being released and stuff like that, I can also see you know, a lot of... You know, backlash still happening towards it because he is still the main actor of the film. Uh, Andy Muschietti recently uh, did an interview where he talked about Ezra Miller and his, how uh, he worked with them. And specifically, he said he's one of, it's like Ezra Miller is one of the best actors I've ever worked with. And I s- sincerely hope that they are getting better because uh, Ezra Miller uh, themselves, they are receiving um, mental health treatment, therapy, uh, so on and so forth. It, it doesn't forgive what they did, but it, it's it's a step in the right direction. Um, I Stephen was talking about how an g- example he came up with was like the Witcher blood origin. No one liked it, but he really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't really like it all that much. And that's coming from someone who's a gigantic fan of the Witcher books, the video games, so on and so forth. Like, really, someone who sort of taps into the lore of that, I really did not like 
blood origin it it just it completely ignores all the established lore and everything so it's like yep see that talking about the lore um i think that if the flash is good and it's considered universally good then everyone will be on board I, I, if it if it is at all if it's a bad film for any reason or if there's some major flaws in it for anything that you could pick apart then everyone will jump back on that well I told you you know Ezra Mill you know they're gonna lump it in but I do believe that you know com- sometimes money box office heals you know recent wounds you know I, I yeah and if the movie is gigantically successful, we're talking like the first Aquaman numbers, quick to break a billion, yeah, like a billion dollars, stuff like yep. that. Yeah. Ezra Miller will return as the Flash. Ye- yes and no. So the way that the Flash movie is supposed to work for uh, the DC universe coming up is that it's supposed to act as one gigantic universe reset, and following from there stuff will actually tie in with the larger dcu that james gunn is going to be setting up i do know that james gunn himself has actually fully sat down and watched the final cut of the film and the way that he says it is one of the best superhero films that he's ever seen and that's saying a lot james gunn is one of those people within the superhero filmmaking community where you're like you generally trust his opinion on most things. yes absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see. I, I kind of, I kind of heard some spoilers and I, I, so I was in Las Vegas recently for the entire week for a work conference. It wasn't CinemaCon. So, um, I was able to go cause it was at Caesar's palace. So I got my pictures in front of the transformers. I got to see the blue beetle suit. I actually got into one of the presentations for Lionsgate and I got myself into the, the convention floor and all that. So I wandered around. I didn't get to see the flash, but, um, one one rumor kind of maybe suggests that what I'm saying may be true, that there could be a continuation depending on how good it is, or they could also use it to dissolve the thing completely. Um, but yeah, CinemaCon was really cool. Vegas was awesome. Uh, if, in, if you've never been, definitely go to Las Vegas. It's uh, We should all go to CinemaCon next year. Like it's press. I, I thought it was just for, you know, movie, you know, specifically CinemaCon is for people that own movie in the industry. The yeah. yeah, they're in the industry. Yeah. So you own a movie theater. Uh, you can pay to go to CinemaCon. Um, the people on the convention floor were like selling, hey, here's 4D. Here's some great snacks. You want to put liquor in your like, you know, lobby? This here. Here's how you can get a liquor license, stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. But it's, it's also a showcase for, for movies, too. You know, yeah, often it's a showcase for larger studios and uh, for all of them to showcase upcoming releases, announce bigger projects, stuff like that. Like, um, recently they announced um, a trailer and new stills from the new Dune movie that's coming yes. out, Dune Part 2, Part which two. I'm, I'm incredibly excited for. The The first Dune that came out, uh, I have a review of it up on my channel, and I loved it. I'm a, I, I love the Frank Herbert novel, uh, Dune. I've read it front to back multiple times. It's a sci-fi classic, and to see it brought to life so well by Denis Villeneuve it's it, it's a match made in heaven. And, you know, Austin Butler, we're going to see if he's a one-trick pony because he has the coveted I, role that was stings. Okay, okay and, so the one thing I know about Austin Butler, um, it's like he is a multi-talented actor. Like, he is incredible. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know... I, I mean, I knew him from Disney Channel and Nickelodeon and stuff like that because I watched those shows when I was younger. But I primarily, he primarily first got my attention in Once Upon a Time in America, where he played where he played Tex. And I'm like, okay, this this guy's doing pretty damn well. And then I hear, you know, he's been casted in the Elvis biopic. I'm like, okay, he doesn't look exactly like Elvis Presley, but there's makeup and stuff like that. I'll see how he. Did. And then he blew my goddamn mind. No it, shit. It, it was one of my like favorite he, movies of the whole year. Oh. It's like he dove so deeply into the mannerisms, the movement, the, the singing. Like he he enveloped the character and the entire personality of Elvis Presley and brought it so beautifully to life. That said, Dune and the character of Fade Ruha is a very, very different character. Very and, different. And the one thing I do love about Austin Butler 
is he really does envelop and get into those characters. And Denis True. Villeneuve is such an incredible director. I mean, he can really mold him into what he wants him to do. Uh, and one thing I do like is that Tom Hanks, when you know Austin was coming off of doing Elvis, and it's like it it took a toll on Austin Butler. Like it it physically exhausted him to the point of where he even had to go to the hospital. And when he was finished, uh, Tom basically said, "Get into the next role as soon as possible, so that way you know you can still." show people that you can do different things you know and that's very great advice too from tom makes and i honestly think that was kind of the downfall of heath ledger he was not able to shake the joker in time or was i mean he went right into um the imaginary Dr. Dr. Yep. Yeah. Um, now, is, now, now the thing is with th there's sort of a misconception about heath ledger and the joker performance and stuff like that uh, a lot of people think, you know, the Joker, you know, it enveloped him. It, it, it like took over his life. And people who were on the set and who were close friends with him are like, no, it didn't. It's like, it's like they were, uh, you know, obviously he kept like a hand diary and stuff like that oh, yeah. where, where he was writing it down in character and stuff like that. But that was just a way of expanding the character itself. It's like what, it's like what was the downfall of Heath Ledger was an accidental overdose of prescription pills. You know, it's like he had been uh, taking prescription medication for insomnia at the time. And he was, you know, massively uh, insomniatic at the time. He could not sleep. And it's not because of any one role or anything like that. It's just he was working so much on so many different things and so many different projects. He wanted to get into directing and doing all this other stuff that it just enveloped his entire life. And it eventually killed him to the point, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like he took his pills and, you know, as he's doing all this other stuff, he completely forgot he took his pills, took more. And that's what killed him. It's a shame, dude. It is. Um, but um, the only other thing I could think of maybe that would also be comparable is maybe Jim Carrey as Andy Kaufman. Yeah. Th now that's, now that's one thing that uh, is a lot more comparable in this sort of scenario. Although, when we compare that as compared to Austin Butler, Austin Butler, he he went method, kind, he, he was method, but, you know, it's like while he was still Austin Butler on set, like people could say, Austin, you know, this is, he didn't go like the Daniel Day Lewis route of being Abraham Lincoln, where he would have everyone refer to him on set as Mr. President, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the probably a more comparable scenario to this would be someone like uh, Jared Leto, in most of the roles he does nowadays, because because he, he goes method uh, with them. He does um, hit or hit or miss Leto. Um, he's very hit or miss. Uh, I mean, he's a good actor. He's a damn good actor for the right role. He has an Oscar to prove it. Yes, absolutely. And what? Gosh, that was that. Talk about a great movie, Lightning Striking Twice, where. You know, yeah. not just him, but um, freaking Matt Damon. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just throw this out because. All right, throw it out. We want to hear all beliefs, baby. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go for Here's it. Face. Um, but uh, yeah, so The Flash, very excited. I'm, I'm so excited to see the merch in stores. And, yeah. you know, it's going to be it's gonna be really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just I, thought of another. Well, it's sorry. Uh, but. Uh, concerning with going back to the DC universe and stuff like that, uh, the one movie I think that will have probably the most detriment coming towards it in the more recent DC movies that are coming out uh, will be Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And that's, I mean, it would have been a lot more of a detriment had it come out last year again, yeah. uh, but the whole Amber Heard controversy and stuff like that, because, uh, you know, Amber Heard, she's Mara, you know, it's like she she was a big part of that movie. And from what I hear, her role has been significantly cut down uh, in in the sequel as comparatively to what it would have been. Thank God. <laughs> which which is saying a lot, too, specifically because of the fact that, well, it's not a spoiler, it's been released, that Aquaman has a son in the movie with Mara. Yes. 
Yeah. So not just just the character. Right. So the Joker didn't envelop him at all. The roles did. Most of his roles caused him the lack of sleep and borderline. Yeah, he was a true professional in the art of. Yeah. All right. No, that's kind of what Matt was yeah. saying too. Yeah. No, I. Completely- yeah, this is this is exactly what I was going through. Oh, yeah. like, like when I was explaining it, it's like everything around him was just enveloping him so much. He was he kept very busy as an actor throughout most of his life into the late two thousands, and it ultimately, you know, it it just. It, it went there. Yeah, it did. I, um, for the DCU, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different things too. come. So not only do we see, we get to experience what the flash is going to be like. We actually, weirdly enough, the success or lack thereof of guardians of the galaxy three. Yeah. Also has a direct impact impact on the flash just because of James Gunn, which is kind of a crazy yeah. sentence to even, even say, one of my favorite movies is Night's Tale. Night's Night's Tale. Tale. It's definitely underrated. Uh, Very underrated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Imaginarium of Doctor Parnassus is also underrated. Yeah, and that's that's it's like it's one. It's probably one of my favorite Terry Gilliam movies. Like and Terry, Gilliam, Terry Gilliam is one of those directors who I just don't think gets enough love as he should. No, and you know it's a shame because he deserves so much more. But yeah. I, I really do think that, um, of course, I, I'm definitely going to be seeing uh, Guardians Three when it comes out. I'm very yeah. excited. I'm hoping it feels more like older Marvel. I'm not one of the ones that also really shit on. I'm a little marveled out, just a little bit, you know. Yeah, because it, it's so- like I, I'm a little marveled out as well. I, like I haven't. Uh, well, yeah, 12 Monkeys is great. I, I'm a little marveled out as well. I haven't really gotten back into the Marvel franchise at all since maybe um, No Way Home. Yeah, it's a, that that was the last truly great Marvel Agreed. movie. Maybe close to that would be uh, Shang Chi, which I thought was fantastic. Um, I, I some people were a little bit hard on. Black Widow. I don't think it's great, but I think some people were a little bit hard on it. Oh yeah, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. That's, that's my that's my favorite, and it's a lot of people's favorite too. But man, just the cast and the time. And I, Hunter S. Thompson. I did idolize at a report in high school. So just just the character period. So a lot of it for me was just more than just Terry Gilliam. But yeah, I, I love I love yeah. that movie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, even like the Disney Plus oversaturation. I just think it's a little bit. But I'm hoping that. Guardians Three has that magic, that old Marvel magic, yeah. and I think it will. I, I think it will. See when we get terrified people from either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, agreed, Onyx. Agreed. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's, you know, I, it's it's weird. It's now it seems to be the the mid budget or low budget movie that is the formula, which is weird. So it's. A couple years back, Marvel and these big superhero movies, they dominated the genre. Now I think that the most successful movies are those mid-budget, you know, they're shooting movies for a lower amount of money and having a higher return on investment. So um, so, so here's the thing. Um, when we concern the mid-budget movies and stuff like that, there hasn't really been a lot of great, successful mid-budget movies in a good while. Um, it's like, right. if, we, if we compare some of the mid budget movies of the past, stuff like Goodwill Hunting and, um, you know, a whole lot of stuff within that genre, a lot of uh, drama pieces, comedies, stuff like that, they mostly became successful for one particular reason. Uh, it's like, yeah, they did well at the box office, but what made them much more successful over time was home media sales. Yes. It's like VHS, DVD, stuff like that. That's what made them a lot more successful. I agree with that because less money equals less stress, happier casts and filmmakers. Most of the time, most of the time, that's true. Most of the time. It, it really, really depends. There are incredibly gigantic movies out there where, you know, they don't necessarily have a set time frame in which they need to have it released or something like that. It's basically this filmmaker has free reign to do whatever they do. They'll release it when they release it. That is the best scenario possible. It's pretty much any Spielberg movie. Uh, you know, it's, it, or, or in the case of James Cameron with Avatar and those sequels. Um, and then there are also big budget movies out there that have, you know, a set date. They need to be out 
and it was just miserable for the entire time, specifically for the filmmakers, not maybe necessarily for the cast, but the filmmakers themselves. The biggest example I can come up with that is the Hobbit trilogy. Yep. Yeah, it's like Peter Jackson. It wasn't even originally supposed to be Peter Jackson behind that. It was Guillermo del Toro. And right. with the studios battling over the lawsuits for the rights of the Hobbit and stuff like that and having to get it out by a certain release date, del Toro was just like, all right, I'm going. Uh, whenever you guys figure that out, that's great. And so Peter Jackson had to get in there and rework the entire movie within like three months uh, re and had to rework it into a trilogy instead of a duology. Agreed. So Onyx Neiman, you made a good point. I'm going to circle back to that in a while. I'm, well, let's talk about it now. I'm so pissed off with the video game industry. I They just keep pushing shit back and pushing shit back. Don't announce it. Don't even get the hype up if you don't have, like, at least a really good firm release date. Like, these movies, like, you know, The Suicide Squad versus The Justice League, I'm like, yes. And now, like, I don't give a shit because it's going to be out. It, you know, it gets pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Oh, so, my so, God. So, with video games, I, I'm a little bit on the fence about because... If you have a larger studio like Rockstar, Rocksteady, or um, Warner Brothers Games, stuff like that, they will announce these big projects. And video games, as compared to movies, they take you know years of development and thousands of man hours in order to get the best possible product out there. Yeah. 2042. Uh, yeah, it bond. And that's mostly because the, the release of it was buggy as all hell. EA, EA in general are not known for having very stable releases. Um, yeah, garbage optimization, specifically for PC. Like PC, the 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 port of that was just awful. Uh, and which is really sad as of recently for um, uh, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Now that's it's saying a lot. It's doing fairly well on consoles. Like consoles, it's doing great. There is some pop-ins on textures and stuff like yep. that, but for the most for the most part, the game runs really smoothly, usually aiming around 30 to 60 frames per second, usually staying within that. But on PC, we're having massive they're having massive, massive crashes. Can we talk about how just like why in the hell would you just PC gamers get shit on all the time. And it's I get console being the the driving factor, but I've never understood why things were never equal. So so the thing about PC is that up until recently, there wasn't really any comparison when doing PC gaming as comparatively to consoles. The, the PC was the clear winner because with PC you can really customize your computer to the point of where it can run some of the biggest graphics engines possible and it can run so smoothly and, and it just really if it's optimized really well for the pc i mean it's just golden it's beautiful whereas consoles they couldn't really get up to the graphics capabilities of pcs um nowadays they're pretty much one for one for the most part uh, and there are, you know, super computers out there, like huge beasts of computers that can run, you know, any game, no matter what the optimization is at like 60 FPS, best, the best graphics engines, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, it's it, it's really up in the air at this point. It's pretty much one for one PC and gaming, uh, P, well, PC and game consoles. That's, you know, yeah. That's actually really well said because too, um, that's I was a PC gamer for a long time, and then you know I switched over to I mean because consoles. I mean, my, as soon as Microsoft got into the market, I think that's when things changed because Microsoft was yeah. you know yeah. Uh, I think um, one of the biggest comparisons um, that PCs were able to do uh, back in the day, uh, and uh, th this was actually a running joke in the PC gaming community for a while. Whenever a new gaming PC or uh, software came out, they would always say, "Can it run Crisis?" Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that that was the mainstay of uh, that generation and stuff like that. It was it's like, "Can it run Crisis?" And that's still that's still sort of a thing because Crisis is also getting a remake. So, damn straight. Um, do you think 
that with the success of the Mario movie, a lot more studios will try to push PC video games in theatrical releases. So, so my thing with video game movies as of more recently, it won't be a surprise that video game movies will hit into a full-on renaissance. Uh, like we're starting to see bigger studios actually put some real effort into video game adaptations. Really, all it is is just up to getting the right writers behind it, the right directors, the right cast, so on. Uh, in June, we're going to be getting uh, the sequel to the more recent Mortal Kombat movie that came out. Yep. Of course, it's still going to have an R rating. It's still going to have, I think it's still going to have the same director and writers behind it. Uh, they're adding in Johnny Cage and a couple other characters from the games and stuff like that. Um, other video game movies that are planned, let me actually bring them up here so but, uh, i'm gonna t- i'm gonna make a bold assessment guys and if i'm wrong in a couple of years i'm wrong but i i'm gonna tell you right now that video game movies after the mario movie are be- are gonna become the new comic book movies yeah i'm gonna tell you uh, right now yeah i would i'm i'm 100 with you on there like i i think full on that video game movies are probably going to become the new marvel uh yes. Okay, so some of the more recent video game movies that have been announced and are sort of in the works, uh, a Bioshock movie is uh, in the works, Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, uh, they're doing a film adaptation of that, it's being directed by um, Chad Stahelski, who did the John Wick franchise, Uh, he's also doing another video game adaptation, I'm trying to to remember what what else he's going to be doing, Uh, I know that... um, yeah, it's like he's doing Ghost of Tsushima. Oh, yeah, um, I remember. He's doing uh, Rainbow Six. Uh, yeah, and, oh, my and God, yeah. He's doing it with Michael B. Jordan. <sighs> yeah, video game movies are going to be the new Marvel. I yeah. tell you, like, um, like, I want to really, like, that Bioshock, that better be good. I really want a great Bioshock. Um, uh, Minecraft movie is in the works sometimes. Jason Momoa? Movie. I think Jason Momoa is right. in the yeah. Minecraft uh, five, uh, the Five Nights at Freddy's movie is going to be coming out this October. Oh shit! You know that's good. When that blows up, and it will. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Jim Henson Studios and Blumhouse mixed together, like that. Sh- and Matthew Lillard. Oh, yeah. Dude, as, as, as Will Atherton. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a third Sonic the Hedgehog movie is also in the works. Um, well, they got uh, lead up. Uh, we, uh, we have a Borderlands movie that's being directed by Eli Roth. That's right. Uh, it's like they've already filmed pretty much everything for it. Uh, Jack Black is going to be playing as um, Claptrap. Um, it's like Jamie Lee Curtis is also in the movie. I forget which role she's playing. Uh, there's a Gears of War series, I believe, that's in the works over at Netflix. And um, Dave Batista is part of that. It's like so not interested in the uh, Borderlands movie. I mean, I'm I'm kind of interested in it because um, the game it's, itself is kind of a movie. That's true. Yeah, yeah. We got the Fallout TV show. Uh, yeah, there's a Fallout TV show. I believe it's being made for Amazon. Yep. Uh, they're also working on another video game adaptation, God of War. Yep. Uh, yeah, and uh, hold on, let me. It's like so because I, I think they have actually announced who they cast to play as um, Kratos. So uh, God of War TV. Give me a Skyrim movie or give me death. I would love a Skyrim movie. Like it's too it couldn't couldn't happen. Too, yeah, I just don't think it so, unless it's announced uh, right off the bat a trilogy, at least would take to do a, a good Skyrim movie. Yeah. Uh if I remember correctly, um it's like hmm. I tell you, I would love a Diablo movie. I would kill yeah. For a Diablo movie, I don't think again. I don't think that's possible, um, but yeah. I would love for yeah. a Diablo. Okay, um, Red Dead. Yeah, Red Dead. Red Dead would be fantastic. Uh, Jack Black actually has said that he would love to see a Red Dead uh, adaptation, like a TV show done for like HBO or something like that. Oh, Good speaking, of, H- speaking of HBO, speaking of HBO, obviously we have uh, The Last of Us. It's getting a season two. Uh, probably going to be out sometime around like twenty twenty four. Going back to God of War, if I remember correctly, I heard it somewhere. I can't remember if it was official or anything like that. Uh, but uh, it's a with God of War 
Uh, I believe somewhere uh, it said that Michael Jai White was going to be playing as Kratos. Oh and if God. it's going to be, if they're going to start out in the timeline with the younger, angry Kratos, that is perfect casting. Absolutely, holy shit! That's that's what that's yeah. Video game <laughs> movies are going to be the next Marvel. They've already setting themselves up. Um, yeah. You could just name a thousand Nintendo properties, right? Like yeah, Legend of Zelda. <laughs> Uh, Metroid, Gears of War, Star Metroid. Fox, uh, Star Fox, yeah. It's like there's Splatoon could probably be its own movie. It's like there's like so many franchises out there that could be their own movie, especially in the Nintendo catalog. They have so many different properties, and thanks to Mario, they're probably going to happen now, especially a Legend of Zelda movie. So, and would you want a live action or an animated Legend of Zelda? If it were in the past, um, it, like if it, if it were years ago, like I remember IGN uh, did like an April Fool's joke where yes, I saw that. I remember that. they did a live action Zelda trailer, and it looked legit. Like it looked like something that Peter Jackson would do from like Lord of the Rings, that sort of feel to it. If it was years ago, I'd be like, put it in live action and make sure that Link doesn't freaking talk. Uh, nowadays, I'd be like, you know, if they can pull it off with Mario, make make it animated, and also don't let Link talk. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there was a there was a, a Legend of Zelda cartoon back in the day. I yeah, uh... back in the eighties and the nineties and everything. And the the main thing I remember from that was Link being an absolute piece of shit, and his main catchphrase being. Who will excuse me, princess? But contrasting the fucking Sonic uh, cartoon back in the day with Steve Urkel himself as the voice of... Yeah, well, there were two different ones. Yeah. There were two different ones. There were two different uh, Sonic cartoons back in the day. There was the the first one, which was pretty crap. Yes. Uh, you know, it's just a regular sort of Saturday morning cartoon. You know, just, you know, make it for kids, had some ed- educational bits some PSAs, whatnot. And then you had Sonic Sat AM. Yep. Holy shit. Like, it was a dystopian future. They were yes. fighting against Dr. Robotnik and stuff like that. It was, it was badass. Sure was. Damn straight. Oh my god. I'm ex- I, I personally am so very excited. I, I, I just hope they never do a Call of Duty movie. Um I just just make there is a way of doing it. There is a way of doing it. And if we're talking back in the day and stuff like that, because there is one movie in particular which shows that a Call of Duty movie could kind of work. And that's have you ever have you ever heard of or seen the movie Hardcore Henry? Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Yeah, so done entirely in the first person, silent protagonist, all that sort of stuff. Completely bonkers. It is completely bad shit crazy. And it works. It True. all works because it, it drives off of the silent protagonist and stuff like that. I mean, it's a little jarring because it's in the first person the entire time, but you go with it. For me, and I, I, as, as, it, but as well, it's only good. Because there's good writing from the other characters, there's great acting throughout, and there's great action. And when it comes to Call of Duty, if they're going to do it in the traditional movie style and stuff like that, which essentially it would work like that if they're going to make a Call of Duty movie. But if they're going to do it that way, there's only one good combination for it. And I, I'm not saying this is a good combination in the sense of, like, he would be the best filmmaker to make this movie or something like that. I'm saying it because it fits the most with just how this filmmaker works, and that's having Call of Duty directed by Michael Bay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, that that franchise has gone to the point of where it's so over the top, it's so crazy, it is so Hollywood blockbuster, there's no other pick I can make out there other than Michael Bay directing it. I don't care who writes it, as long as it's Michael Bay. <laughs> and you know somewhere Michael Bay is sitting in the office, and that's his number one pick of anything you could do comic book related. You it's know that not Michael Bay is video game. absolutely beyond the... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hot, man. Michael, you know, even... Now we have the Nintendo uh, lands, right, in, or, in Japan... And Hollywood and Orlando, yeah. Universal itself is expanding. Uh, yeah, when yeah. when you when you start making theme park rides based off of video games, the mm-hmm. movies it's just gonna 
you know, it's going to explode. And The Last of Us actually really sort of paved the way. Uh, on, you know, on, oh, yeah. it, on, it you know, blew up. It's, it blew up on HBO, and understandably so. It was incredible. Yeah. It, it, it was it was one of the best. Not only just one of the best video game adaptations, but it was one of the best written TV shows, period. It's like, I didn't think a TV show based on a video game nope. where I already played through it could make me absolutely ball like a goddamn That baby. third episode is one of the... That third episode, episode broke me. Any TV show ever. Yeah, it, it's one of the most well-written episodes in television history. 100%. And one of the most well-directed, one of the, probably one of the best acted as well. Nick Offerman, as you know, as much as I loved him from his comedy background and everything, I'm like, okay, let's see what he can do with this. And he made me goddamn cry. He delivered. He delivered. And then some. Nick Offerman's one of my favorite people ever. Like, I read all of his yeah. books. I have a piece from his wood shop. Um, you know, if I can meet anybody, I would just sit around a campfire and talk to Nick Offerman for yeah. let's, with, 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 with a decent scotch. Oh my god, with a lagavulin, you know. Um, Hold on. <laughs> you got, you better have some lagavulin. You, I'm gonna be super impressed. No, 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 I don't. Hold on. Who would you uh, pick to play Kratos in live action? Oh shit! Cra See, that's. Onyx, who you who you who you thinking? That's that's gonna be that's a very specific sort of. What do you say, Kratos in live action? Yeah. Oh, it's definitely got to be either Michael Jai White if they're going to do if that angry young Kratos. It's gonna be him, or they already have a perfect actor to play him as the older Kratos. Get it's like you got to get the actual actor who played him in the more recent games. You know, it's a like, um, uh, Christopher Judge. Yeah. True. True. Anyway, when it comes to Scotch, no, I got Glenn Morangy. Oh yeah, absolutely. You've got great yeah, ten years Glenn Morangy. It's like it's gonna have a decent. Yep. Uh, doesn't have as much of a pop to it anymore, but you know, it's like still. Hey, so let's. Uh, we've got a few minutes here left. I want to keep it a tight uh, hour, even though I could talk for five hours. Um, <laughs> let's let's yeah. do that. So you, of course, you know, um, are in the film industry. Yeah, you could. That is a hundred percent fact. If someone does anything in the film industry, they're in. The, you're in the industry. Never diminish. Yeah. You shouldn't diminish yourself as a person ever, but never diminish your accomplishments. Trying to find his name. All right, good. Let me know, uh, Onyx. So, for you, three actors, living or dead, to spend an afternoon with. You can choose whatever you want to. It could be just sitting in a car talking. Or sitting, you know, in a restaurant. Three actors, alive or dead. Three actors, alive or dead. Okay, so the first one uh, would be, well, the first two would have to be Sir Ian McKellen and Sir Patrick Stewart. Great choices. Okay. It's like, it's like just being able to talk with them and stuff like that. Plus, they would just, they just have such great stories to tell. And then the third would have to probably be Jack Black. Ooh, excellent. Okay, so then what would you do? We'll just pick one of them. You and Jack Black have the day. What are you guys doing? Oh, me and Jack Black, we're we're hanging out in a studio. We're listening to Tenacious D. We're making songs. We're doing all that shit. We it's like we're we're doing some fun shit. Have Kyle Gas come along. Let's do let's do some fun shit. Uh whereas with uh Sir Ian McKellen and Sir Patrick Stewart, we're getting out a nice bottle of wine, maybe some scotch, you know, just Sitting down, having some nice talk, nice talks, some nice stories. I get some food here, stuff like that. This just has a nice afternoon. Sweet, hell yeah! Onyx Demon said, um, "Sir Sean Connery, Michael Clark Duncan, and who was the other one?" He said, My "Mel Gibson, Sean Connery, Mel Gibson, Michael Clark Duncan. Excellent choices." Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see, for me. I'm going to go, I'm going to just stick with Nick Offerman for sure. He's going to be on my list. Um, I'm also going to go with, um, oh my God, I've played this over and over in my head a thousand times. And I'm going to go with Michael Keaton too. And then for my third one, I'm going to go back to someone that's passed away. I'm going to have to go with, um, shit. I was thinking like an old cowboy movie. Like I think it would be fun to hang out with John Wayne if, as long as he wasn't being anti-Semitic. Uh, no, 
He's not an actor, but he is to me. I'm going to pick uh, Jim Henson because he was an actor. He was. I Jim would, Henson would be oh my perfect. God. And I've, it's like Jim Henson is one of those people who I've looked up to for so long. And the one thing about his characters, specifically the Muppets, is you can look at any one of the productions, like any one of the actual performers themselves. They can uh, be on like a talk show something like that you can see them right in front of you but as soon as they put whatever puppet is on specifically you know uh jim can put on kermit and immediately your eyes are drawn to kermit absolutely and and as soon as he starts talking as a character jim disappears and your eyes are focused right there you turn into a five-year-old again yes and what a brilliant ahead of his time what a brilliant man and he really changed the world not just and you know that was just on far too soon Oh, my God. See, talk about, like, someone that was taken from us. Going back to the Heath Ledger thing, Jim Henson was just... So, yeah. If you want a good cry, and sometimes we need that, right? We watch movies to cry. I watch The Green Mile, um, all that stuff. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Watch Jim Henson's funeral. Watch yeah. it. It's full entirety. It's like it is the, the one portion that will make everyone break every single time is the song that Big Bird does. Yeah. And at the very end of it, he just says, thank you, Kermit. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's just, it, it's just a stream of tears going down. You know, we'll finish this conversation just on Muppets. So I yeah. really loved the Jason Siegel Muppet movie. Oh yeah. It's fantastic. It's and really, really. And, and the sequel, the sequel it's like the sequel as well, I think is like incredibly underrated. Oh, I just couldn't get the thing about the thing about the Disney era for the Muppets. They don't know what to do with them. That's right. It's like ever since like 2011 and after Muppets most wanted and everything, they don't know what to do with those characters. I know what to do with them. Make goddamn movies. Yes. Let, let the Jim Henson company actually do what they want to do. Damn like, straight. Uh, like Brian Henson. He has, so many ideas. They have so many scripts from like Jerry Jewel and everything. They actually still have the script that says the cheapest Muppet movie ever made. And it's a great idea. Jim Henson, Frank Oz, and Jerry Jewel all wrote it down. It's a great script. Make that! Just make that. Yeah. You know, the weird crossovers and the, the failed TV shows and, you know, I had such high hopes with, for the Muppets in the Haunted Mansion because the Haunted Mansion is one of my favorite rides ever. <laughs> I thought that one was actually okay. It was okay, but it should have been amazing. It could have been amazing. Yeah. And and but and, and there's there's that, one there's one aspect of the more recent Muppets that I really don't like. And and I don't blame the performer himself. It's like I'm sure he's a great Muppet performer. I'm sure he has a lot of great stuff. But the new performer that they have as Kermit, who replaced um I, I forget who I forget the actor who replaced Jim Henson because uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now. I'm sure. Uh, I see his face. Uh, yeah, Stone Cold. Yeah. Stone Cold is Kratos. Nailed it. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no. I love Stone Cold. He is not Kratos. <laughs> he is. It's like, let me tell you something. We're going to go over here. We're going to have some beers. It's going to be a good time. All right. Like, Bill Goldberg then. Done. <laughs> oh, Lord. But yeah, no. Like, the guy is Kermit now. What? Just can't get into it. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's just the voice is too nasally. It's too a little bit too high pitched. It's like it sounds up here, kind of like this, and I'm just like, no, that's that. It's like that is not Kermit. And it's, it's just say, like they've taken all of like the edge away from Kermit, and he's yeah, got an edge to begin with. But however, he's just you know Miss Piggy's blanket, um, and he just you know is. I don't know. However, I am mildly curious and excited about like the the Doctor Teeth TV show. What yeah, that think? actually it's like the uh, it's like Muppets Mayhem. That looks great. It's like that looks like a lot of fun. That looks like a lot of fun because you've been Miss Piggy to death. We've been Kermit to death, and that's the thing. Back in the day, like it's like they, seeing yeah, it's like seeing Doctor Teeth and the the Electric Mayhem and Animal and stuff like that. Animal used to be my all time favorite yeah. puppet, so. Seeing where they could go with this, 
I'm I'm excited. This yeah, take the minor characters, right? The, you know, but yeah, because like everyone knows the main cast so well. When they were doing the movies, everyone had arcs and storylines. Now they don't know what to do with Fozzie. They don't know what to do with Rolf. They don't know what to do with all these other characters. So I'm so excited yeah. about Muppets Mayhem. I do think that's going to be uh, very good, very good. Yeah. Like for sure, you know, all of it, man. It's going to be so good. Now, the Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. Oh my God. Give the Swedish chef his own show. Give him a like a whole parody cooking show. A whole parody cooking. Like, Do it. It's like just have like actual celebrity chefs get onto there and stuff like that. Make it like it's hot like, ones. Make it like hot ones. Yeah. You know, but like you know, he's you know also trying to like or between two ferns. That's the perfect sort of like mashup. Yeah. But then he doesn't like everyone. Everyone trying to understand what yeah. Swedish chef is saying while he's doing these interviews, but it's a, instead of, like, you know, celebrities or something like that, it's these big celebrity chefs or yeah. something like that. 100%. And then, you know, get someone like, you know, Gordon Ramsay, who, for some weird reason, knows what he's saying. Yeah, That's your it's like, get somebody's like, oh, shit. How can you not understand what he's saying? He said medium rare, not Hiddish Kadu. Yes. See? Disney. Marvel. Hook us up. We got these ideas. We got ideas. We got these great ideas. Well, Matt, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to wrap it up here at the hour mark. Um, we'd love to have you back on anytime you want to be on. Onyx Demon, too, man. 100%. Like, you know, I know that you're more in the Twitch space, but I love these collaborative efforts and we could talk all day long. We, could, we I, I think that on our channel, it should be more than a, 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 a weekly thing once a week. We make it a couple times a week. Um, Matt, before we wrap up, please, again, promote whatever you got going on real quick. Yeah, so um, it's a upcoming. I am doing a review of Jurassic World Dominion, of which we are also going to be filming a cameo with you yep. uh, into the review. And uh, uh, upcoming after that, uh, we are currently writing, or it's I mean, my buddy are currently writing a review of Knucklehead, the straight to DVD uh, WWE movie that was made with the big show. And then also Aging Cody Banks, too of which we completely skipped over the subject we originally started we did, this stream on. Save it for next <laughs> Early week. 2000s movies. Save it for, that'll be, I promise, that was, that's what we'll lead with. Next week. <laughs> um, but also, you know, you can check out some of your previous work with uh, our good buddy, buddy Alex Chavo. And, you know, um, you, you know, I know that Onyx Demon knows trauma. We can get into it and stuff. But go to Trauma now. See. Go to, go to watch.troman.com uh, and check out The Raker House, uh, a film that I co-produced uh, along with uh, John Covert. Uh, and uh, check out the movie, The Raker House. It's available now on watch.troma.com as well as on Roku. And if you guys are watching this right now or in the past or in the future, definitely check out more videos from Geek Pulse. Click like, comment, subscribe, all that. We're close to our milestone. We're so very close to being partnered. It's ridiculous. It's, it's great. It's just great. It's good times. It's good people hanging out together, talking about movies. Like, subscribe. We'll see you on the next video. Matt, take care. Onyx. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. Yeah, check it out. Like, replay this back. Yeah, definitely go to watch. Say it one more time, Matt, so he gets it. Watch. Watch.trauma.com. And uh, you get the first month for free. So the Raker House, R A K E R H O U S E. Yeah, not the Racker House. Poor Dustin. Yeah. <laughs> the Raker yeah. House. Raker House. Check it out. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care, Matt. Good night, Onyx. Check you out later. Later, guys. <laughs>